Hey guys, it's Mr. Kennedy back with video 23. In video 23, we're going to talk about nonspecific defenses and a thing called Coach Postulate. Now, when we look at Coach Postulate, here, here's a picture of Coach Postulate. Now, let me just go through this picture real briefly. Basically, what happens is we have an infected animal here that dies of something, and we're trying to figure out exactly what it is it dies of. And what we would do is we look at its blood and see different things in the blood and we try to figure out which one of these actually caused the, the animal to die. And then we take a swab and wipe it on what's called a nutrient agar plate and allow it to grow colonies if it would grow colonies. Okay. And then if we had picked out the right thing, we should be able to take a little bit of this colony and put it into a syringe and inject it into a healthy animal. And that a healthy animal should also, should also die, just like the first animal did, but we should be able to re-isolate the exact thing that we started with, and we should be able to regrow it exactly like we did to start with. And if we do, then we found the pathogen. Now realize, if we can find the pathogen, then we can hopefully find the cure. So now, the more scientific way of what Coach Postulate is, is it's a series of rules used to identify microorganisms that cause a disease, and this is basically how it works. The pathogen must always be found in the sick organism. The pathogen must be isolated and grown, which is step two. Um, the cultured pathogen must be placed in a new host and cause the same disease, but cause some different symptoms, then we probably didn't have the right pathogen. And the pathogen must be re-isolated and be the same as what it started with. Maybe it make sure it hadn't been mutated anywhere along the line. But that's basically what Coach Postulate is. So Coach Postulate gave us a way to figure out what the pathogen was, therefore we could start to uh, find a cure. So how are diseases spread? Well, there's four ways basically how diseases are spread. The first one is direct contact. This would be by you kissing or smooching up on someone. Sex, of course, would be one. Or even holding hands by directly contacting each other. The second would be indirect contact. I see kids in my classroom all the time sharing drinks. They just don't realize that you know, they're, they're sharing whatever they may have with each other. Um, but you can get it from drinking after one another, eating after one another. Even if you, you know, if someone had your desk first period and they were sick and you came in second period and laid your head down just like they did, you might get it from the desk itself. So indirect contact. Um, contaminated food and water. You know, if the food's partially cooked or if we get water that's got, uh, let's say polio in it, then that would be one way. And the last one is through vectors. Vectors are infected animals. Most common examples are ticks, fleas, mosquitoes, rabies. You know, mosquitoes are vectors for malaria. They transmit malaria from person to person. Fleas and ticks. Fleas are most famous for the bubonic plague, which was one of the most deadly plagues, plagues to ever hurt, hit the earth. Um, you know, killed almost one-third of our population. Uh, ticks, Rocky Mountain spot of fever, things like that. So these are vectors. So four ways in which diseases can spread, great test question. Um, the next thing, so if we know how diseases are spread, we can figure out the pathogen by Coach Postulate. What actually happens? Well, our immune system is what fights off this infection, and it, it, it does it in several ways. There's basically two types of defenses. There's nonspecific, which is going to affect everything the exact same way, and then there's specific. Today we're going to talk about nonspecific defense mechanisms. Now, nonspecific defenses would be, the first line of defense would be like your skin, of course. This is the most important nonspecific defense because it keeps out most things. Realize there, there are microorganisms, pathogens that are constantly trying to invade our body, constantly trying to find an opening. Uh, now, of course, we have openings that are here all the time, our mouth, our nose, our eyes, our ears. You know, we always have openings there, but we have ways to protect these. But, you know, if I were to go cut my finger, that would be an opening that's not normally there. So, Pathogens will be waiting, waiting to try to get in. That's why it's important to clean out the cut, add antibiotics, uh, keep it covered, etc. But the first line of defense is your skin, probably the most important. Also, the first line of defense is your secretions, like mucus, saliva, tears. You know, I have an opening in my eyes where my tears constantly coat my eyes, and that prevents uh, most things from getting in my body. Um, I have mucus in my nose and down my, down my throat that actually, and saliva that captures any particles that may enter. I actually have hairs in my ears and my nose that help filter it out as well. Now, the second line of defense often called is the inflammation response. You might have heard this 
as um, redness, heat, swelling, or pain uh, are what's linked to the inflammation response. Now, we often uh, counteract this with the RICE method, which was rest, um, ice, compression, and elevation. Now, basically what it is is the inflammation response is if I were to hit my leg on a table, then blood would rush that area to make sure there wasn't a break, to make sure there wasn't a break in the first line, the skin. And when blood rushed to the area, I've got more blood there than should be there. So it's going to cause it to be swell up. It's going to cause redness to be there. It's also going to cause heat. You know, if I were to go jog right now, my face would probably turn red because my blood vessels in my face would, turn, would have more blood in them and be releasing heat from my body. So it actually would release heat. You know, if you get a bruise sometimes, you can put your hand on it. You can actually feel it being hotter than the areas around it. And then it's going to make pain. Think about it. If you had... If you're supposed to have this much blood in the area and all of a sudden you have this much blood in the area, you've got a lot more pressure there, so that's going to cause the pain. That's why, you know, as a coach, I would tell you to put ice on it, which is going to cause the blood vessel to get smaller, which is going to reduce the pain and the swelling. I'm going to tell you to elevate it, which is going to make less blood go to the area. I'm going to put compression on it, which is going to, cause, which is going to reduce the amount of swelling. So, you know, that's why we tell you to do those things whenever you twist your ankle or something like that. Uh, and the last type of nonspecific defense mechanism is a thing called interferon. Interferon is exactly what it says. It interferes with the production of a virus. Kind of think of it like this. If, if I threw 10,000 bicycle parts in, this, in a room and told you to put the bicycles together, if I gave you the instructions, it would be a lot easier for you to put the bicycles together than if I didn't give you the instructions. Well, that's basically what interferon does. If your cell is making viruses, interferon will take the instructions away so it has a harder time making, making the virus, okay? So does, do these defense mechanisms always work? Absolutely not. If they always work, we wouldn't need specific defenses like antibodies. But they, they work pretty doggone well considering how many things are trying to invade our body constantly. Okay, guys, that's video 23. I hope you learned something and have a good day.